Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here. Thank you, Marcel, for in inviting me and everybody else involved in the um, decision. I can tell you that when I, before dinner, was looking at my predecessors who'd stood here to deliver the Abby Bennett lecture, I felt very honored to be in this spot. And I'd like to just briefly pay tribute myself to Avi Bennett, because I first met him when he was the head of McClellan and Stewart. And I was surprised when one day I got a call from him, because he wasn't my publisher. This was in 2005. He called and he said, can you drop by? I've got something for you. So on my next trip to Toronto, I went to see him at 481 University Avenue, and he handed me a volume of poems bound in calfskin. I had just published a biography of the Mohawk poet and performer Pauline Johnson, Terawanawaka. I'm not the only person in this room who's done a biography of Pauline Johnson. I'm honored to see uh, Carol Gerson here too. This was a first edition of one of her books, and it was a generous gift, but Avi didn't stop there. He went on to say that he liked what I was doing. At that point, I was writing biographies of mainly forgotten Canadian women. And he, I was trying to attract a whole new audience to Canadian history, history. He told me, that's important, don't stop. And he put his own money where his mouth was, as we know. He was chair of the Historica Foundation and he endowed this lecture series. And his death earlier this year was a big loss, not just to this university, not just to the literary community and all the authors that he'd published, but also to public history. And that, so I'm really honored to be giving a lecture in his name. When I was invited to give this lecture, I was sent the list of ideas that participants in the current conference, 150 ideas that shaped Canada, might want to contribute papers on. I have to say that some of the ideas sounded like Netflix series. The Crown, Mosaic, Dead Ducks. Others, such as canoeing, body checking and curling brooms, Tooks and Parkers, suggested a roots sales conference. And some, frankly, had a 1960s textbook vibe. Staples or responsible government, while others just played it very safe. The North, the weather. <laughs> I know that you are doing erudite work on these subjects, but I can tell you that as a writer of popular history, the list was a wonderful glimpse of Canada in 2017, struggling to re-examine the old stereotypes and at the same side, at the same time, to stay abreast of startling demographic evolution. Here we are, Canada. It's a tough landscape on which to explore important historical themes that emer have emerged here, and we're limiting ourselves at the moment to just the past 150 years. But I'm very happy that this conference is being held during the sesquicentennial year, and I'm impressed to see the breadth of papers being presented because I've been pretty disappointed at the way that history has been quietly but deliberately ignored in many of our national sesquicentennial celebrations. Not many Canada 150 events have had much to do with the past. Few of the projects have explored the evolution of Canada from a handful of br fragile British colonies, 1867, where indigenous people were barely recognized, to the prosperous, diverse country we live in today. History was one of the themes originally selected by the Conservative government in 2015 to qualify projects for sesquicentennial federal funding. But in 2016, the new Liberal government announced a new set of themes, quote, diversity and inclusion, reconciliation with indigenous peoples, youth and the environment history had been canceled. The preferred themes match the rhetoric of Prime Minister Trudeau, who identified Canada as, quote, the first post-national state in a New York Times interview soon after his 2015 election. 
He went on to say, quote, there is no core identity, no mainstream in Canada. Prime Minister Trudeau suggested to the New York Times that what characterizes Canada is our openness, respect, compassion, willingness to work hard, to be there for each other, to search for equality and justice. These aspirational values are the ones that put us on the front cover of The Economist, and that made us all feel pretty smug. <laughs> and I'm sure most of us are happy to claim those values. Yet where do those values that the Prime Minister says typify Canadians come from? The values themselves are not unique to Canada. Most of them are feel-good aspirations that would fit equally happily on government websites of several other countries. Hello, Scandinavia. Are we really so indistinguishable? No. What distinguishes Canada from, say, Sweden, are specific episodes and movements in our past that have moved us towards becoming the complex community that we've become. Yes, we are a liberal democracy with deep respect for human rights, but it is our history and the circumstances in which we adopted those values that make this country unique. My own contribution to sesquicentennial year was my book, The Promise of Canada, 150 years, people and ideas that have shaped this country. My previous nine books were all non-fiction explorations of people and events of significance in our country's past, written for a non-academic readership. Promise is the first book in which I attempted big history. In my previous books, I focused on a particular individual or event, Alexander Graham Bell, or the 19, 1890s Klondike Gold Rush, for example. And then I used my subject as a lens through which to illuminate a whole period or an aspect of social history. The Promise of Canada was much more ambitious. I wanted to explore for a large readership the evolution of the entire country since Confederation. I adopted an unusual narrative strategy. I dodged the challenge of a single national story. Instead, I forded the years from 1867 until 2017 by using as stepping stones mini biographies of people who, in different ways, contributed to the evolving Canadian psyche. I began with Georges Etienne Cartier, then rolled through the next 150 years, one individual representing each generation until I arrived at 2017. The final chapter covers a range of contemporary Canadians, from Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi to Kenyan-born rapper Shad to Ontario businesswoman Annette Vercheron. I embedded each individual into a larger narrative of Canada's development. This approach allowed me to describe the Canada of each subject's childhood through their eyes, rather than through an exclusively 2017 lens. And then I could assess their achievements within the context of their day. This was the way I was taught history. Understand people and events within the context of the times and the choices available to them. Don't rush to judgment. Some of my choices were well known to most Canadians. Artist Emily Carr, Medicare champion Tommy Douglas, writer Margaret Atwood, politician Preston Manning. Others have frankly disappeared from popular memory. Colonel Sam Steele of the Mounties, historian Harold Innes, lawyer Justice Bertha Wilson, OG Cree leadership Elijah Harper. Why did I choose these individuals? Like the organizers of this conference, I was interested in the ideas that shaped modern Canada. However, I know that my readers are not your readers. I do not have to worry about peer review, tenure committees, and footnotes, although I have to say that these days my books do include footnotes because today's general readers want them. They're pretty suspicious of anybody who sets themselves up as an authority. But I do have to worry about something that was always close to Abby Bennett's heart, sales. <laughs> How do I recruit readers? Over my writing career, I have discovered that readers will plunge into any vicarious new experience if they can be shown the action 
through a participant's eyes. When you explore the varied and conflicting truths in the stories of individual lives, you can illuminate their ideas and their decisions without diminishing their power. That's why the 19th century British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli once said, read no history, nothing but biography, for that is life without theory. I did a very personal analysis of what I considered the key characteristics of modern Canada, and then I looked for individuals who had either introduced specific ideas into the collective psyche or who symbolized important aspects of this country. I began with Georges Etienne Cartier because he championed a federal system of government for the new dominion of Canada long before John A. Macdonald caught on to the idea. Our federal system of government has allowed this highly regionalized country to weather stresses that would te tear apart more rigid, centralized systems of government. My next choice was Sam Steele, an Ontario farm boy who was an early recruit to the Mounties, because the Northwest Mounted Police were the first all-Canadian institution, and they embody this country's tradition of law and order. Yes, their record has been tarnished over the years, but they're probably still the most recognizable symbol of Canada in the world. Discussing this early police force allowed me to examine how the BNA promise of peace, order, and good government has operated since the Mounties were founded. No one can try and pin this country onto page or screen without acknowledging its vast and extraordinary landscape. Artist Emily Carr captured not only the mystery of the Northwest Pacific rainforests, but also the existence of indigenous peoples. Something that the Group of Seven, otherwise known as our national wallpaper, didn't always acknowledge. And so I continued through successive generations examining the sinews of our economy, our embrace of a tax-funded healthcare system, our blossoming literature, regional tensions and populism, growing respect for individual rights and freedoms, and the struggles of indigenous peoples to make their voices heard. However, I used all the skills of a biographer to bring my readers into my subject's life. How did Emily Carr's own upbringing as an ornery tomboy on the outer fringes of the British Empire spark her respect for the Haida, Gitsan, and Simshian peoples? How did she capture on cam canvas and in print the menacing mystery as well as the glorious beauty of West Coast rainforests and the hideous destruction caused by clear cutting? How did Harold Innes's experience of British officers in the trenches of the First World War when he was a lowly private, convince him that Canada should loosen the ties with what most of his colleagues, Cana most of his fellow Canadians still called the motherland. Innes did what he called dirt research. He spent his summers on Canada's major rivers, which he argued provided crucial horizontal trade links across the northern half of this continent. His analysis of the geographic co cohesion of British North America that predated Confederation, the theory underlying his most famous book, The Fur Trade in Canada, was in part fueled by his certainty that this country was more than an artificial political construction. Professor Innes is a challenge for anybody, including scholars today, which is perhaps why he is largely forgotten outside the academy and not always well known within it. Brilliant and irascible, he was so prolific and eager to rush his ideas into print that his books became increasingly inaccessible. One critic wrote about his gift of, quote, snatching obscurity from the jaws of clarity. <laughs> Yet he was a towering figure in his day whose ideas provided the kind of nationalist argument about the historical integrity of Canada that Canadians were eager to hear in the 1930s. Skipping forward a couple of generations to a figure who played an important role in securing the guarantees of human rights that characterize modern Canada, Justice Bertha Wilson. Justice Wilson, you may recall, was the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada. I actually hate this photo of her 
It's so severe. And in fact, she was a very proper Scotswoman, but she, was, she smiled a lot more than you'd ever guess from this photo. She arrived at the Supreme Court in 1982, the same year that the Canadian Constitution, in which the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was entrenched, was patriated. The Charter guarantees a long list of individual rights, including democratic rights, legal rights, and mobility rights, along with an equally long list of fundamental freedoms. Freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, expression, the press, peaceful assembly, and association. Some of these rights had been taken for granted before, but none of them had actually been codified in Canadian law. The Charter specifies Indigenous rights should be protected, and it recognizes the diversity of Canadian society. But when it first became the law in 1982, all those promises were just words on a page, a tossed salad of terms that had to be interpreted and tested in the courts. The big question was, would Canadians stick to narrow def definitions of all those brave promises, or would they interpret them expansively so that the rights of individuals were increased at the expense of the muscular powers of the state? Today, the Charter, along with the flag and Medicare, is one of Canada's best known national symbol symbols, repeatedly cited in, in national opinion polls alongside Medicare as a crucial element in the national identity. The freedoms and values that it endorses have made it a model for other countries. It has given the Supreme Court of Canada more influence internationally than the US Supreme Court. But it is challenging to engage a general audience in discussion of how these values have become established within our culture, because so much of the discussion employs fairly esoteric legal terminology and philosophical arguments. However, the life story of Bertha Wilson allows readers to understand these co concepts in a more accessible way. The high moral values and the dogged determination of this Scots-born woman who arrived in Canada as, quote, the accompanying spouse of a Presbyterian minister, played a crucial role in shaping the way the Charter was interpreted. When we learn how she was consistently underrated, we can understand how she developed her sympathy for the underdogs of modern society. When she applied to Dalhousie Law School, for example, the dean was scornful. He didn't think much of this soft-spoken immigrant who said she wasn't sure what she'd do with a law degree. He snapped at her, quote, we have no room here for dilettantes. Why don't you just go home and take up crochet? She persisted. And once she arrived at the Supreme Court and the court began to hear the first charter cases in the late 1980s, she was a terrier. Of the nine Supremes, she was the most sympathetic to people who claimed a charter right to protection from established laws. She was often alone, but she pushed her male colleagues to go beyond the nuts and bolts of case law and to incorporate the insights of sociology, philosophy, and history into their discussions. In the first hundred charter cases heard by the Supreme Court, the nine judges upheld about one third of the claims. But Wilson upheld their rights more than half the time and she made a real difference in cases involving legal protections for immigrants and refugees and the rights of women. If, as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau suggests, Canada is particularly character characterized by, quote, respect, compassion, and our search for equality and justice, it is at least in part thanks to the arguments made by Justice Bertha Wilson a quarter of a century ago. Skipping forward again to the present day, I realized that Canadian attitudes to diversity and immigration had to be in my book, as they are certainly on the general public's radar. They will be covered in at least three of your sessions in the next 48 hours. I chose to write about Nahid Nenshi, mayor of the city of Calgary. Nenshi is part of the diaspora of Ismaili Muslims. His parents fled to Canada from Tanzania. What gave this first generation 
immigrant, the confidence to run for civic office in the city of cowboy booted oil men, in a part of the country, moreover, where Christian fundamentalism thrives. Through Nench's story, I was able to explore the importance of publicly funded institutions, schools, libraries, recreational facilities, in integrating newcomers to this country. Our healthcare and education systems may be looking a little threadbare these days, but they still work. If Canadians are less fearful of immigrants than the citizens of other OECD countries, and polling clearly demonstrates that we are, it's because we have developed the institutions required to welcome people of dramatically varied backgrounds and faiths. So I used a biographical approach to help readers understand context, intellectual and political commitments, life circumstances, personal priorities. My goal was to give readers different ways to think about Canada and to add new layers to popular knowledge of our history and to make it a good read. I wanted to cover the issues that would engage readers, but I also had to stay abreast of public opinion. The section on Elijah Harper was particularly hard to write, as I was writing it during the time that public attitudes towards Indigenous peoples were undergoing a momentous shift. Some of you will recall the emergence of Elijah Harper on the national scene in 1990. He was then a Manitoba MLA who helped ensure the Meech Lake Accord would not go through. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the tortuous constitutional crisis of the late 20th century. And I'm not going to get into the biography of this OG Cree chief either. It's sufficient to say that this residential school survivor lived the story of First Nations in this country. He personified both the ways that they were pushed to the margins of society and their quiet struggle to make their voices heard within the national conversation. For my purposes this evening, it's sufficient to say that many of us will recall the image of this shy, mumbling, middle-aged man with a long ponytail and a bolo tie, sitting in the Manitoba legislature holding an eagle feather, under pressure from the whole ever edifice of institutional political power in this country. We remember him quietly saying, no. This is the man who finally forced the rest of Canada to pay attention to the 1.4 million Indigenous Canadians, the broken promises, unfulfilled legal responsibilities, the lack of clean drinking water, health facilities and adequate housing on reserves, the addiction issues and family dysfunction. He enlarged our angle of vision and he left a permanent mark on this country. He put a spotlight on Indigenous claims. But when I was writing about Elijah Harper, 25 years later, there was a much greater awareness of Indigenous issues and far more sympathy for First Nations. Scholarship and politics were converging. The hearings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were bringing to light the appalling personal, social and cultural damage the schools had wrought. The Idle No More movement, shown in this slide here, was asserting Indigenous rights. And at the same time, this is where scholarship is so important for actually underpinning with real facts the uh, political movements of the time, James Daszak's book, Clearing the Plains, had revealed the deliberate campaign in the late 19th century by the federal government to starve prairie bands. Indigenous history was now in the spotlight and politicians, if not scholars, were competing in moral outrage at the ghastly truths that were emerging. But opinion was polarized. When I told friends and colleagues that I intended to write about Elijah Har Harper, I often got the reaction, why him? When I circulated early drafts of the chapter, I got much stronger reactions from both sides. Partly this was because the collapse of the Meech Lake Accord, which was designed to get uh, Quebec's signature on the 1982 constitution, is generally viewed exclusively from the non-Indigenous point of view. I was too sympathetic, I was told, to the Indigenous arguments. I had ignored Ottawa's well-meant attempts in previous decades to deal with the dreadful problems facing First Peoples. 
At the same time, from the indigenous points of view, I was too critical of the weaknesses of their political organization and was unable to step outside a colonial frame of reference. Canadian history is a minefield, but I don't think this justifies any attempts to simply bury it. Of course, by the very act of selecting these particular Canadian characteristics and in individuals, I was skewing the narrative. Why was there no industrialist or scientist among my subjects? Why had I not included one 20th century Quebec Quebecer through whose point of view I could explore the national unity crisis? Where were representatives of particular communities, Chinese Canadians, LGBTQ groups, the Inuit? My answer is that no one creator can encompass every story out there in our extraordinarily diverse citizenship. In fact, I had already excluded two groups that I know will be discussed at sessions in the next two days, prime ministers and hockey players. <laughs> Most readers actually seemed incredibly grateful that, I'd admitted prime, prime, that I had omitted prime ministers and I had not done any further boosting to the swelling Trudeau industry. Hockey was another matter. The absence of a Rocket Richard or Wayne Gretzky turned out to be much more shocking. At book events, I was frequently told that Canada is all about hockey. But this was not history by committee. This was my book. And frankly, I have absolutely no credi credibility as a hockey commentator. I mean, just listen to my accent. <laughs> I've had far more traffic on my website for this book than for any of my previous books, partly a function, in my view, of the growing appetite for engagement and dialogue that the internet has bred. Obviously, it's gratifying for an author to hear from happy readers, but I also suspect disgruntled readers probably think that contacting an author is a waste of time. I was, however, discouraged by the number who made it plain that they don't normally like history, hadn't expected to enjoy the book, and had acquired it only out of a sense of sesqui duty. And a shocking number wrote about their ignorance of Canadian history. One reader's comment that I treasure, but I find really poignant, was, quote, I felt as though I was discovering my country for the first time. No wonder that we have seen outbreaks this year of the kind of ahistorical thinking that most of us here find pretty depressing. I'm talking, of course, about the debate over whether Sir John A. Macdonald's name should be stripped from public schools that bear it. Our first prime minister is not alone in this public shaming. The name of his fellow father of confederation, Sir Hector Langevin, minister of public works in Macdonald's cabinet, was stripped from a government building in Ottawa. Egerton Ryerson, once celebrated as the champion of free and compulsory schooling in Upper Canada, fell under the same cloud the cloud of supporting the residential school system. Angry advocates have suggested he does not deserve to have a country named after him, even though he spent most of his career championing such 21st century principles as civic equality, religious freedom, and public education. I'm not going to go into the debates that these names have generated and how the legacy of each man might be judged. As you might guess, I support the idea that we should regularly re-examine the reputations of our predecessors. But I don't agree that they should immediately be cast into the outer darkness if they don't meet today's standards in every aspect of their decisions and careers. No single individual embodies everything we want them to. Life is complicated. As a writer of popular history, I'm more interested in the larger question of what Canadians think history is. For most of us, it is not a prosecutor prosecutorial narrative, a whodunit in the style of Louise Penny, in which we can play Inspector Armand Ganache and discover the smoking gun. Nor is it a context-free dive into the minutiae of a single aspect of the past to be written up as a scholarly monograph written for an audience that might fit in this room. Instead, it is the tangled weave of stories we choose to pull out of the inchoate past and tell ourselves.
These stories are complicated and intriguing, some inspiring, inspiring, some very dark indeed, and they say a lot about ourselves and our world. They can help contemporary Canadians understand how today was shaped by yesterday and where we might go tomorrow. The history of this land goes back thousands of years, and it is because of particular events, struggles and past lives that Canada in 2017 is one of the world's most prosperous and admired countries. Canadian history can be intellectually challenging as we try to understand different eras. It can be suffused with ideology, filled with pulpit, pulpit punching, or it can be drenched in media sentimentality. Our history can be the raw material of great art in such novels as Jane Urquhart's Away, Lawrence Hill's The Book of Negroes, or Guy van der Haag's The Last Crossing. It can be a cultural pleasure, like listening to Mozart or studying astronomy. It can be used to construct an imagined community, as videos like the His Historica Minutes or television series such as Canada, The Story of Us, have demonstrated. Yes, these stories require constant renegotiation and adaptation as the country evolves and changes. Gone are the days when the likes of Arthur Lower and Abbe Gru told us what our history was. We are now engaged in a healthy, sometimes abrasive dialogue about who we are. Scholars, writers like me, museums, documentary makers act as the interpreters, the prism for this ever-shifting tale. However, these stories, our history, are an important part of the present as well as the past. I certainly don't endorse Prime Minister Trudeau's view that Canada is a, quote, post-nation state with, quote, no core identity. The post-nation state slogan strikes me as an easy way to duck hard questions and slide into a dangerous amnesia. This country has actually proved much sturdier and more resilient than anyone might have expected. Sturdier and more resilient, in fact, than the Fathers of Confederation expected. So it's worth asking, how did that happen? And it's worth supplying a smorgasbord of answers that Canadians will actually want to sample. The contributions of scholars like you to this debate are crucial. Those whose audience is outside the academy, whether script writers, museum designers, novelists, or authors like me, depend on your research and analysis to ensure that we keep re-examining re yesterday so we can understand how we reach today. I used the phrase, the secret handshake in my title today. And as my final point, I want to explain why. I stole the phrase, not from the Freemasons, but from artist and pop culture commentator, Douglas Copeland, who uses the phrase to describe our collective sense of being Canadian. Although Copeland is best known for work that has universal themes, after all, it's Copeland who invented the phrases Gen X and McJobs, he's fascinated by artifacts that are uniquely Canadian. Crown Royal bags, stubby beer bottles, ook picks. Copeland's work was featured recently at the Royal Ontario Museum in a show, show called Everywhere is Anywhere is Anything is Everything. The show looked at global interconnectedness. But there was one section devoted exclusively to uniquely Canadian products. The section was called The Secret Handshake. Copeland has said, quote, only Canadians care about Canada. It's a weird identity. It's like being the youngest of 15 children. You don't get as much attention, but you do get away with a lot. <laughs> the secret handshake is a perfect metaphor for how Canadians relate to each other, although most of us cannot articulate our Canadianness. You only in fact realize what being a Canadian is all about when you're out of the country, particularly if you then meet another Canadian. That's the secret handshake. I began this evening regretting that history had played no role in the sesquicentennial ceremonies, but elements of our shared identity, developed in part by the ideas this conference is exploring, were celebrated. My favorite elements in this year's rendition of the secret handshake, by the way, 
were the fireworks that exploded over Parliament Hill on July the 1st. Only a Canadian would understand their brand names, each of what, which has some history attached. What were those names? Crazy Canuck, all dressed, and the pièce de résistance of the firework display, double-double. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>